I want to welcome everybody to the uh, Zoom webinar. Uh, it is uh, basically the state of, of the kind of the state of LGBTQ acceptance in men's hockey. We're focusing on men's hockey today because the women have their clearly their own issues, but there are there are a lot more uh, women players who are out or out Olympians. There has never been in the history of the NHL an out NHL player, either retired or active, which is a, the only sport that's never had that. Uh, way back in 1994, when I was a sports editor for a mainstream paper in Southern California, and openly gay, I was actually on the Canadian Broadcasting Company, had a 90-minute documentary on gays in hockey, and they had three current players at the time who, uh, their voices were altered, but they were talking about the struggles they faced. This is like more than 25 years ago, and that much long later, we still do not have an openly gay player at the pro level. We're having a lot more people coming out at, at the college level and, and also at the elite level. Uh, people may have seen earlier this week a 17-year-old from Canada uh, who had been drafted by, I guess, with an, uh, an elite junior league, um, which is a stepping stone for many players in the NHL. He came out as gay because he didn't want to, he didn't want to hide anymore and he wanted to own his truth. And we have four people today who have all come out publicly on, on out sports. They've been out in various uh, capacity for a while with coming out stories. I'll introduce them. One is uh, Stephen Finkel. Stephen uh, plays at St. Thomas Aquinas College. He's also a referee. His, his long-term goal is to become an openly uh, NHL, NHL official. So we wish him with that. Uh, Adam Fryer. Um, Adam plays at the Wet Wentworth Institute of Technology in Boston, formerly played at University of New Haven. Um, his coming out story was fantastic. Photo of him in a pride flag. It's uh, really worth uh, worth reading. Uh, Gordy Machard from uh, Iowa. Uh, he played University of Iowa. He's also a, a hockey referee for many years. Um, and he's now at uh, the College of Public Health, University of Iowa. And Brock Weston, who graduated from Marin University in Wisconsin, lives in Canada. And uh, Brock came out uh, with an open letter of six things to tell his teammates of what to not do and not do around a, a gay teammate. So I want to open it up, uh, first question to everybody, but it's something that, Gordy, you wrote in your essay. I want to read it. Um, a hockey player is an athlete to the 10th power, presumed to be not just skilled, but crazy aggressive and apex predator. So how could a boy who played hockey all his life, a boy who was now a man, not fit all these traditional definitions of a guy's guy and be gay? Can you talk about that quote exactly and what it means for the culture of hockey and how you struggle with that. And then I like everyone else to kind of chip in on the same thing. I'm imagining it's a common theme for everybody. Yeah. So it's actually something I talked about with my, with my aunt and talking with her as I was writing this letter and we were kind of bouncing back and forth of what were the key things about hockey that made this decision for me so difficult. And she right away started talking about this masculinity and how hockey kind of stands at this apex of apex of masculinity. And I think the hardest thing is I, hockey is always going to be this aggressive, very rigid rigor sport. Um, and I think it's hard. I think it's hard to make that transition into the stereotypical view of homosexuality and let this, this tough masculinity vibe that hockey has. It's tough to let down that guard mentally, uh, especially growing up knowing that, that I was gay for, for quite some time. So it was hard for me to, to make that adjustment mentally and say, hey, it's okay, this is fine. Um, but let hockey carry on that, that toughness because the hockey should always remain that way for me. Uh, Adam, did you, did you have the same pressures you felt? So how I kind of tackled it is like, I, I felt that like my sexuality kind of didn't like define who I was necessarily. And like, I liked being able to kind of separate myself from who I was. And I realized over time that it was not about like kind of isolating myself. Cause I felt like I like isolated myself in the locker room or whatever. Um, Cause everybody just was like, Oh, they're so much tougher than me. And I kind of just sat there and was like, Oh, I'm just kind of tired of this. So I kind of just eventually built it up and like kind of just discovered that I just need to be myself and, and be that like, again, the masculine side, the masculine side and of hockey. And then I could have my own side of life too. And 
um, I just became comfortable with both sides and kind of combined them. So. No, but Adam, you came out, you had to come out to two teams, which yeah. is sort of doubly stressful, right? <laughs> yeah. So I, I started off my wonderful college adventure and uh, at the university of New Haven playing um, division two football um, where I was a, a kicker. Um, yeah, I know a kicker. Um, but then I ended up getting uh, pretty sick with mono and stuff. And uh, I decided, and I was playing club hockey at the same time um, as well as playing football and my coach didn't like that. And I kind of decided um, to come out and I had spoke to one of my like RAs um, at the time who was close with like all the hockey people and he was also gay. Um, and he kind of just told me like, listen, like you have to understand that it's yourself. You have to be true to yourself. Like you got to love who you are. And that's one thing that I kind of just live by now is like, you got to love yourself and that's, that's it. Um, a, a sort of similar thing with Steven and then Brock, uh, Stephen, you uh, began your essay by saying how uh, you beat a goalie on a, a power a penalty shot shootouts in practice three times, and he, as you walked off the ice, he called you a, an effing faggot, and that led to uh, basically a, pretty much a near brawl. What about that moment just made you sort of like snap, I guess, for want of a better word? And why did you set uh, up a very hockey way by having a fight? Well. I mean, when, when I was playing juniors and, you know, going through the steps to, you know, maybe make it to pro over overseas or wherever it may be, or just college, I was always the fighter. I was the third liner who would get scrappy in the corners, you know, the goals out in the front. And I, my, I knew my job was to fight. So, I mean, um, I think that's what kind of helped me hide my sexuality is that like I was way more masculine than, uh, that that might be the wrong thing, but I always hid underneath this shell that, you know, I'm a, I'm a bigger guy. I could, you know, throw my body around. I'm able to fight. So <clears throat> I think at that moment, I was just kind of, um, you know, I kind of blacked out, but I think I was just kind of done with, you know, it gave me an opportunity to actually be who I am. And I'm pretty happy for that because, I mean, like Gordy and I talk a lot and he, he helped me tremendously a lot. Um, so thank you, Gordy. But uh, hey, you're welcome, buddy. It was uh, it was tough at first because, like, you know, I told one teammate, and then uh, it kind of just led from there. And then once that whole story kind of blew up, it was just like nothing but positivity from the team, the school, to everyone on campus. Like I couldn't be more happy. Now, this may be a weird question, but the fact that it was settled in some ways a very hockey way did that make it better? <laughs> like sort of, you know, you uh, I, I don't think it, it, it made it better. Like, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the, the team wise, you know, like, uh, that, that's something you shouldn't have to do in practice, but you know, um, very old school and in, in the way of like my junior team, if you had a problem with some guy, you would drop the gloves right in practice. But, um, you know, college is a lot different with the fighting rules and everything. So you just can't drop your gloves in college. You guys got to talk it out. And I haven't fought in two years. So, uh, I think also it just it just built up. I mean, I, I think I was just done with everyone kind of guessing or like, you know, the locker room talk, um, because we know how that that is. Um, if you're not if you're not out, you know how it is, and you know it, it's it's very homophobic, um, just from everything. So I think I was just done, and I snapped. <laughs> So Brock, I want to follow up on that, but something you wrote that I think goes along with this whole theme of having to hide, you, you, you came out to your teammates with basically an open letter of like things you, you they need to know about uh, you being gay. And you all, one thing that struck me, you said, we often talk about leaving your shit at the door of the rink, but because of this environment, that's where I've had to pick it up. I can leave it here and be myself to an extent, but when I come back, I feel judged and uncomfortable. Can you talk about that dynamic, how for you, the locker room became a thing that was frustrating as opposed to supportive? Yeah, I mean, it, it stems from, a, you know, a variety of things, but that was kind of our, our coach's theme was, you know, leave your shit at the door. We're here to be a family. We're here to be brothers. Um, but, you know, like Stephen just said, like the talk in the room doesn't make you feel like family. It doesn't make you feel like a brother. It doesn't make you feel like they got your back. And that, that isn't necessarily for them to be blamed. They obviously didn't know. Um, 
so I think that's kind of like the whole topic of this is just the, you know, the transition and, and understanding of, you know, not just in the locker room, but just the things you say to people and how it impacts you. Like, cause it made me, it made me obviously wait till I was 24 years old to, to, to tell, like, I, you know, only like three people knew before that. So. Yeah, first for our audience, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat uh, thing and we will, we will get to them. But I want a question for everybody. Just talk about the culture of hockey. I mean, this idea that that you feel you have to hide, and what is it about the culture of hockey that makes it still seem difficult for people to come out? Gordy, do you want to start? Yeah. Um, so I think about I think about how young a lot of a lot of hockey players start playing the game. Um, when they're still very moldable from a mental standpoint. Um, when I did an interview for USA Hockey, um, I, re I regret reading a lot of the, the comments, but from 10-year-olds, 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds, um, leaving pretty harsh comments on, on that Instagram page really made me think about how how tough I think the game could be that these kids have to prove, you know, that they're tough and have hard skin and, and not accepting of a lot of things. And they're pretty narrow minded um, when it comes to homosexuality for sure. Um, so I think it's starting at a young age, I think we need to, I think we need to broaden the horizon when it comes to thinking about stuff like that. And like Steven said, the, the possibility that somebody in the locker room may be gay. Um, I think it, it comes from the people that have a little bit of authority, their coaches, their parents, um, letting them know that that's not, that's not acceptable, the type of language. And, um, and growing up and playing at Iowa, it didn't change much, unfortunately. So I think, I think the feeling that, that playing this sport, playing hockey, which is very similar to football, in my opinion, with the toughness, I think they feel like they have this, they need to be tough on the outside and not let, not let maybe what they potentially are truly feeling in. And I think it's really hard for a lot of people, especially with, with the dynamics of, of hockey and the culture that uh, still stands to, to be accepting of, of homosexuality and for possibly teammates to be gay. Does anyone else want to piggyback on that? Yeah, I'll hop in on that one. So I think Gordy nailed it on the head early on when he was, you know, first speaking, you know, hockey's that tough sport. And he said, I think it needs to stay there. And I couldn't agree more. Like the last thing I would want to see is, is hockey turn into soccer because like, we're like, I mean, it might sound, you know, toxic masculinity, but like, that's, that's one of my biggest outlets. That's where I let my frustrations out. That's where I allow the fun, you know, basically just kicking ass and having fun, you know, get run over. You know, my, my dad always used to say, and a, a hired man we used to have at the farm would always say, you weren't in the game until snot went flying out of your nose. So I, I don't want that to change, but you know, it's just the, like he also mentioned it, Gordy said it in the beginning, like mindset and, you know, being aware, being open, um, being accepting. And that, that doesn't have to change the sport. That just has to change who you're, who can play. Adam or Steven, anything you want to add or? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, uh, like Gordy said, you know, it, it's just, it's a um, very masculine sport. And I feel like there's kind of like double negative where people don't think you could be gay and play hockey. Like, I feel like that's a very big stereotype. And <clears throat> I mean, me being a coach as well, and also refereeing, like I see three different sides of it. And to piggyback off, off of like what you're saying with coaches, I think that um, when coaches do their safe sport for USA hockey. I think they should incorporate maybe like a pride video or, you know, or attend, they have to attend like a seminar along with USA hockey for, you know, 15 minutes just to educate them on certain words that they might not think that's offensive, but is offensive. Uh, before you're done, Stephen, I got a message here from Ken Daly, president of St. Thomas Aquinas. I would greatly appreciate your courage. You have the support of our entire campus. So kudos to you. Thank you, President Daly. Uh, Adam, uh, we have some questions from our, our, our uh, watcher, our viewers, and here's one a lot of people talk about. 
So many people talk about the fear of the showers and with that comes unfounded stereotype that all gay men are predators. How did you address this issue? So kind of, I didn't really kind of address it. I initially I kind of like hid myself in the, in the showers. You know, you go shower with the boys and whatever. And um, when I came out, nothing really changed um, other than like they joke around a little less and whatever, because they knew I didn't really tolerate it. Um, I kind of shut that down after I, I got frustrated with the word fag being used in the locker room. Um, but it hasn't, it, I just, I, I really, things have, things changed once I kind of came out. So. Brock, what about, was that an issue for, on your team or for yeah, you? No, I, I mean, I, uh, I address it right in my speech to the guys, like, I told them, you know, we talked about being a family and everything. Like, you don't look at your family like that. And that's never changed for me. It was never like that. Obviously, growing up, you started like that. So it never, never even dawned on me. And I think um, it's kind of funny. I Like every team I've ever played on, all the guys talk about it and all the people in the town, you know, the junior, junior town, towns or whatever, the people around there, they talk about it that um, it's like a kind of a cliche saying, but they always say like uh, hockey players are the gayest straight guys you'll ever meet. And I think there's like a huge irony in that, especially since this is what we're talking about. Um, but yeah, no, like I, I hit it head on in the speech with the guys because obviously I knew that was going to be the first, first thing that came to their mind. Like, is he staring at my horn? Like, no, like, that's not what I'm here for. So like, get over yourself. I see it in the chat here. Someone said, you know, it comes down to like a personal insecurity. And I 100% agree with that because that's never been my, not my top priority. Can you, uh, can you expound on what, why it's the gayest straight sport? Yeah, I mean, like, you, you got to know a few more hockey players maybe to know, but it's just some of the conversations that are had. Um, that you know what stays what happens in the locker room stays there and it can it can be that way but um you know some of the conversations that are had and and the the relationships and you know different kinds of bonds that you build but in a platonic kind of way i guess well curtis gaber just said ha ha nailed it brock so <laughs> i guess that answer at home um gordy you're by far the oldest of the uh, four panelists here Thank you. Uh, <laughs> just joking. I have a question from Stephanie. As a diversity inclusion consultant who focuses on LGBTQ in inclusion, I'm a big believer that education is key. Talk about that. Talk about the education that should happen from coaches, administrators, whatever, uh, on this issue. And should it be a uh, how should that be handled on a school or team wide basis? Yeah. Um, I think. I agree. Education is huge, especially when we put so much pressure on, on the players, because they're the one that are making the comments. They're the ones that are making those judgments. A lot of the times, a lot of at least what we hear. Um, and I, I hate to just leave it on the players because at a young age, they're kids that are developing at the college level. They're just trying to be college kids. They're trying to figure each other out. So if we have, if we have these people that are in a, authoritative positions that are educated, but just at least open-minded, aware of the potential that homosexuality does exist in this sport. And it's quite prominent as we're finding out. This is, um, Yannick has, has proven that, you know, even someone as young as 17 is comfortable enough to come forward and say, hey, I'm gay and this is how it's gonna be and I'm still gonna excel at my sport regardless. So. Um, if we can, if we can talk to these Mike coaches, these squirt coaches and just open it up to them and, and just shut down those negative comments that are made, um, the word fag, um, homo, you know, that's gay. So many people say that. In fact, I went along with it when I played, you know, I didn't want to stand out. I didn't want people to know, but I think those people of authority, I think will, it'll, it'll go a long way. Uh, Stephen, you, you have spoken to, or at least chatted with Yannick uh, in Canada, who came out this week, 17 questions. He's being celebrated and supported publicly from all levels of hockey, from the NHL to various media outlets. Is this the new normal of acceptance? And if so, what are the challenges that remain in team culture that make it difficult for most players <clears throat> to be themselves? Well, 
I mean, Gordy and I talked earlier, and, uh, you know, there, there's a reason why I came out at 23. I didn't feel comfortable. I thought my teammates wouldn't accept it. I thought, you know, my parents weren't going to be there because you hear these stories of, you know, young athletes or just young kids coming out, and they don't get the support. So, I mean, I, I think it's amazing what, the, what Yannick has done being so young and 17 because, you know, think about when you were back at that age, you know, you, you're hearing like, Gordy just said, you know, you're here in fag, no homo. And you like, I played along too. It's kind of like just a game you kind of have to play. And um, I, I think the struggles are still going to be that, you know, until there's, you know, a few guys who make it to the show, like it's never going to be as accepting until you get those professional players in the mix. I mean, I hate to say it that way, but that that's just the world we live in right now. I mean, you, you look across the country, there's so much hate uh, just in general. And it's tough to, you know, because I feel like everyone has their own challenges. So with with that being said, I mean, Yannick, I think he just blew it op- blew the doors open for hockey. Like, I, I guarantee you, you're going to get, I would say, 10 more, 10 to 15 more stories by the end of the year of just gay hockey players. Because he's such a an amazing kid and amazing – player at that level that you know for him to do what he did at the level he that he's playing is truly you know there's no words you could put into perspective yeah i i agree steve um i just i want to at least from my point of view i think it's so important that we don't especially for closeted gay men that are playing the sport currently i don't want to sit here and preach and, and put pressure on them that that coming out is the right thing for the hockey culture to change. That's not that's not what I want for them. That's not what I want for me. It's not what I want for any of us. What needs what needs to truly happen is the people through within the allies like Curtis. He's been so genuine to all of us. Um, I think it, I think it's going to take a lot more people that aren't gay that are straight and supportive um, because the pressure of, of saying we need so many NHL players to come out as gay is, is so hard. It's so hard. Even though I, I agree, Steve, it will, it will help us tremendously something like that to happen, especially for a lot of youth players. Um, but it's just, it's pressure and we've all felt it. We've all felt it since we were young, as soon as we knew we were gay. So, I don't know. It's gonna take. It's gonna take an effort. Gordy, I I agree with like all of that and stuff, and I also agree with the education factor as well. I think that teams and um, leagues can be doing a lot more for like including either like events or well when things get back to normal events at least um, of LGBTQ um, like just inclusion, kind of teaching people what's wrong, what's what's offensive and why it's offensive and how people feel when they're on the ice or how people feel when that is said. And it, it's, and I, again, I don't want to see hockey, hockey become soft and um, taking away kind of some of the, uh, the bicker on the ice is, is a good thing. Um, but it, it won't, it won't let the game lose the, uh, the grid it has. So. Well, I sort of along that whole, idea we have another question is a gay hockey sorry is a gay college someone who's gay they're a college hockey fan one thing i find the hardest is how homophobic the stands and student section can be any advice for how to cope with this especially considering it's not always safe easy possible to confront the perpetrators yeah um i can speak on that so i I never, I never had a problem once, like after I came out, it, it pretty much stayed with the team and I respect the guys to the nth degree for doing that because, you know, like I said, that was where I intended it to go and that's where it went. So, um, but we, we play in a really tough conference or we did play in a really tough conference and we would get some intense fans at a few of the schools and you'd hear some, you'd hear some shit that you did not think that you could hear. <laughs> like it was bizarre, but um, I can't, I can't, sorry, gay stuff, like anti-gay stuff. 
Yeah, and like full spectrum, like, you know, aimed at gay people at any kind of race. Like it was, you hear pretty much everything from both ends of the spectrum and everything in between. Um, but I remember, I, I, I can't necessarily speak to being in the crowd, but I remember just, just laughing on the ice. Like after, you know, getting a couple apples, we're burying them and they're chanting from the stand something about that or race or whatever. And you just, you just got to laugh at it. It's, it's ignorance. It's oblivious. It's, it's, I don't know. It's, it's little people, little people. What about any other guys? What did fans ever have an influence? Did you hear it? Did uh, or did other did opposing teams say stuff that made you cringe? Yeah, um, especially as an official working in a junior hockey barn. <laughs> um, God, it was awful. Uh, some of the things that people would say, um, and not just uh, homosexual things, it just the usual banter as well. But I think that is a official after I played I think that's probably what made it most difficult for me is because as we step on the ice nobody likes us nobody wants us to do well I mean the only people that want us to do well are the players that always get penalties and they don't want to be guilty so they try and talk nice to us and those are probably our best friends on the ice but the coaches don't like us the players don't like us and for me the thought of coming out publicly and on out sports as I was a referee, I, I couldn't even, I could not even imagine, which is why I give so much credit to the other people speaking on this panel that are still involved in the games so much. Um, because I, I just couldn't even imagine these people that already have negativity built up and then just building that next factor um, for them to figure out that I was gay and, and say some of the things that they already were saying anyway. Um, I think it just speaks to the courage that, that these guys have. Um, Steven, uh, and this is a question quickly for all of you. Um, the most surprising reaction to your, your public coming out, the story you wrote for Outsport, something that surprised you from either a person or a comment or something you weren't expecting? Uh, I, I would say just, I mean, a lot more NHL guys reached out. I really? Mean, to me. Yeah, I mean... You know, besides from, you know, Curtis, Kyle Palmieri, Michael Grabner, and Brady McDab, I mean, I, I, I had messages from AHL players, NHL players, to guys in the KHL, like, I, I'm, like, all over. Um, so, I mean, I, I think just the pro athletes that it reached, and, you know, um, I'm very fortunate to still be able to talk to, you know, those four guys that, really kind of helped me through my time and the fact that other guys reached out that you know these are professional guys and like it, it means a lot that they're reaching out and saying you know we're proud of you or you know don't be afraid to play don't be afraid to be who you are don't be afraid to ref don't be afraid to coach so I think that was like the biggest like shocker was how many <laughs> dms I got from you know these NHL players Adam I was kind of shocked with how far my like how far my article kind of reached. I I was getting I was getting emails and um, contacted like DMs um, from people from like Australia, and then my story went to Germany, and I was I was shocked. And it didn't just reach hockey players; it reached um, a lot of athletes. And I um, had even gotten reached out to by another uh, smaller podcast. Um, and he asked me to come on and kind of talk about, uh, again, like hockey culture and how it was brutal. Um, and that was something I never really had, would thought kind of would happen. So the kind of whole story being published kind of opened my eyes a little bit more to um, how many <laughs> gay men or people who are gay are in hockey. I, I was shocked. So. Brock? Yeah. Um, I had, I never had one negative reaction uh, so that was a huge plus for me because that was literally my biggest fear. Um, I had former NHL players, never had any current or anything, but it was actually people I'd known. They were from around where I'm from. A couple reached out on Twitter and things like that. Like Adam just said, I had people from Australia, New Zealand, like all over Europe, um, the northern part of Africa, all over North America. 
it was bizarre. Like I had, and then once I like graduated and it, I, you know, posted something about graduating, um, I had people sending me, uh, asking for my mailing address, sending me, you know, graduation cards and congratulations and things like that. It was amazing. Like the support from complete strangers just kind of gave, you know, a little, little spark in the hope for humanity. <laughs> Gordy? Yeah, I actually, I had probably one of the most refreshing days that I've had in a long time when uh, I got a call from Kenny McCudden, who's the assistant coach for the Columbus Blue Jackets. And he was actually my skating instructor when I was, when I was young. Um, I was in what he called his hockey golf camps and uh, would always harp on me to use my edges more, but that's another topic. Um, but he reached out and left me this, this incredible, incredible voicemail just saying how supportive him on behalf of the Columbus Blue Jackets, how supportive they are of my story and a couple of things that the players are saying. And it just it was really, really nice. And just to say what these guys have said, people from all over have reached out. And a psychologist actually from from Australia had reached out to me and said he was going to use it. He had a hockey player um, that he was going to use my story to help help this kid cope with a little bit of with a little bit of uh, instability that this kid was going through. So um, I just think it's, I think it's incredible. And Joe, I saw in your comment, is there anything that gives you hope? Is there anything that gives me hope that things are changing? Um, I think all of this gives me hope that things are changing, that there are people out there in the professional level, in the amateur level, in the youth level that are reaching out and saying, hey, this is okay. You know, we're still gonna support you. And I think all of us have been touched by that in a way. Um, and especially, especially the guys in the NHL because they get the most visibility and that's just how that is. And the support, the pride nights and all that kind of stuff. I think that's great. I think all that stuff is great for visibility. I think we need to work on what's happening behind the screen a little bit further, but I think we'll get there. Yeah. yeah just to, sorry, Jim. Just well, to... like, sorry, I want to interrupt. We, uh, Gordy was saying a lot of groups. The group, the You Can Play Project, has done a great job with hockey. Uh, players like Brock McGillis, former players, have been really inspirations. We had a um, Brian Hicks, a former Frozen Four official, yeah. uh, had a coming out story this Tuesday. So there's, there's more and more people, more and more support. So I'm sorry to interrupt, Brock. Go ahead. Oh, you're good. That's right. I was kind of going to comment on that. Like, there's been so many people, you know, feeding off of it. And Gordy reminded me. Um, of kind of like uh, of the reaching out that you talked about before like um, and you talked about pride nights is what made me think of it um, I had a, a researcher at a university in Australia reach out and they posted it they'd done a research study on the pride nights and how it influenced and the perspectives of players that had taken part in pride nights uh, pr like prior and post and how it had changed and and their view and experience and so that was pretty interesting to get that, you know, published and, and acknowledged. And like you say, you talk about the visibility. I think it's one way to get behind the screen, but it's also, it's also putting it out there in front of it as well. Uh, from the questions, uh, it's a good one because all you, you all played youth hockey. Thinking back to your years of youth hockey, what's the single most display of support you could have hoped for? And would it have been from a coach, parent, teammate, opponent? Not something you did get, maybe something that, you know, like what, what message should be sent in youth hockey so we don't have kids growing up thinking that saying fag is acceptable? And we'll start at the top, Stephen. Uh, I, I would say like the, the education aspect of it. I mean, USA Hockey has done so much more to try and keep, uh, you know, the language that it is. Um, because right now, like anything that's, you know, um, sexual, racist, you know, any of that stuff is now a match penalty, which you're automatically suspended for 30 days with a hearing. So that that's recently within the last, I think, year and a half. So I, I think there's steps being taken, but I think the best you could really do is educate the coaches and the parents. And that's where the young kids are going to learn because, you know, the, the younger you are, the kind of more adapt you are to, follow in your parents' footsteps or your coach's footsteps that you look up to. So if you have the right people surround, um, you know, these young kids and 
keep their minds open. I think that's what's really going to drive it home is the education. Adam, what about you? So I think it's about educating both the parents and the kids. I agree with Stephen. Um, however, I think it can be taken on the ice and off the ice. Um, it kind of just kind of goes down to like the morals of people um, and kind of ingraining it into the future generation of hockey players that this is not acceptable. Um, and yes, uh, USA hockey has done a lot. And I think so much, do so much more, excuse me, so much more can be done um, in the future. And even right now, um, it just has to, just has to happen and people have to kind of initiate it. So. Or do you Brock have anything you want to say on that specific topic, youth hockey? Go ahead, Brock, if you're ready. Yeah. Um, I don't want to I, talk over you. <laughs> um, one of the things we talked about, uh, you know, following that research article was he asked like, what, what do you see as a change? And I think, uh, one of the biggest displays that I could have imagined being so supportive, um, obviously looking back, you know, you maybe didn't know when you were that young, but it's just having, you know, a coach or a parent or somebody just, you know, put their foot down and say no. And, you know, it, it sounds harsh maybe, and I know some people don't agree with this kind of approach, but just make an example of somebody. It's a learning opportunity for everyone. Um, you know, if you have a coach, a, a kid say, call someone else a fag or something, Pull them, pull them right in front of the group and make an example of them. I don't think, you know, I think it's a character building moment for everyone. Um, you know, it, it, there can be some detriment to that and it's a risk you're willing to take, but there's a lot of detriment in the reverse as well. Gordy? Yeah. Um, I think it's hard because, because you can, you can preach as much as you, <laughs> you can preach you can preach as much as you want and you can educate as much as you want um but but is the change actually going to happen um and i when i think of kids that play hockey i think about all the time that we spend at the rink i think about all the time that we spend with our teammates and yet they're still going to school where okay if we start educating within the hockey community it's not going to equate to going to school. They're still going to hear this at school. They're still going to be with friends at school. And, and maybe that may drift into hockey, but I think what we can do is we can make a barrier between, okay, you go to school, you experience those things. You experience the word fag, you experience all the, the awful terms that we use. And then when you transition to hockey, Let's make that somewhere where they can go, where they see the difference, where they say, okay, when I'm at hockey, this isn't acceptable. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to have to start with parents and coaches. I agree with all these guys. But I think as a kid, I think if they can see the difference between how people are treated in school, because I can't speak to that. Every school district's different. But in the hockey community, if they can see a difference between that, coming to hockey, where everything, everything is – it's all inclusive. I think that could be something that's that's strong and speak to a lot of these kids. Uh, talk a bit about just the pressures of having feeling you have to come out, uh, Stephen. This idea that you know straight people mm -hmm. don't have to come out of the closet to their teammates because there is no straight closet. It puts added pressure on athletes, especially, uh, and allies are so important. You talk about just that added stress, you know, the hurdle of realizing you're gay, playing a sport like that, and then having to sort of come out to your team so, so they'll know? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's tremendous stress. You don't know how guys in the room are going to take it because, you know, like when when I came out, I mean, it, was, it wasn't really forced, you know. It was just kind of, you know, my actions and I had to live up to the actions of fighting. So that was kind <laughs> of like it, it kind of like rolled off my shoulders a little bit because I was able to use – a situation that happened in hockey to come out. So I, I, I wouldn't say it, it was easy because I feel like, um, I mean, when my story came out, I put it all, you know, on social media and went to my dentist appointment for two hours. So, I mean, like, so I, I didn't get really immediate reactions until that, you know, two hours was up. So um, I, I think it, it's definitely a lot of stress and, you try and play the game of, you know, you're a straight hockey player 
and you know you, you do the same stuff that the guys in the room do you know you say the same words just to fit in because you don't want to be that at, outcast and you know the biggest question is you know oh you know you're at this party especially you know when you're playing juniors or you're reffing juniors you're out with some of the guys and you're just like they're like why don't you go hit on this you know you know the girl at the bar why don't you have a girlfriend those questions and it, it's kind of like you know you want I, like right now i'm actually living my happiest life ever since coming out so i think i, I don't think it should be a thing i feel like if you're gay you're gay if you're bi you're bi if you're straight you're straight i feel like straight people have it the easiest <laughs> yeah it gets and it for me it gets back to what i said earlier I, it's already enough pressure to especially when you figure it out when you're 12 13 14 you're 21 22 um, it's tough enough to love yourself at that stage and to have the pressure of, of being a hockey player in addition. And then for, for people to say it's, it's at the absolute most truth going to take an NHL player to come out. I just think, I think it's adding additional pressure. And um, like I said earlier, it's, we have to change. We have to change others, not, not the people that are hiding and scared to be who they are. Um, that's just that's just the way it's going to have to be because it's it's just adding additional pressure. And th this comment, I think Adam can speak to this tremendously. Um, that we don't just come out once. It's multiple times. As sad as that is, but it's multiple times. And he had to come out to two teams. Yeah, it's not, it wasn't it wasn't the easiest kind of situation. I obviously used. I was in the locker room and I was kind of getting frustrated with the language like you were, Steven, that was being said. Um, uh, I just kind of had that moment where I just was sitting there and I had a, like a heavy feeling like in my chest. And you guys, you guys have probably experienced this where you got this heavy feeling. You're like, I really don't know if I want to do this right now or say something or speak up or take the action. And I kind of just was sitting there. I was like, listen, guys, shut up. Don't, don't do that. And it just took me all my, all my might to say that. I was like, guys, I'm like, I'm gay. Like, I was like, you can't use that word. Like, come on, like really be sensible. Like that hurts me and it hurts other people who I know, who I love, who I care for. Um, and it's just, it's just about, and once that, once that came out of my mouth, I just felt something lift off my shoulders, put on my helmet, walked out, walked out on the ice and played and practiced, you know? So I, it was actually probably one of my best practices. I felt really, really light on my feet. <laughs> <laughs> hey Brock, uh, sort of along those lines, you you wrote a fact. People should read all their stories. They're on the Outsports. Uh, just do backslash coming out, and you'll find their stories. Brock sort of wrote a manifesto for how to come out as gay to your team. And one of your points, I loved. You said your teammate, "You can ask me questions because don't fucking lie to yourself. You've got questions." I think that's so important because you want people to talk. So. So all you guys, what are some of the either funny, weird, interesting, provocative, insightful questions you got from your teammates as, as an openly gay teammate? Brock? Um, yeah, no, I immediately spoke to that because I, like I had, I've had friends and even the people I told before, you know, that I trusted the most and everything, they just didn't know how to approach it. And so that's why I just wanted to open the floor and just be like, listen, don't lie to yourself. Like you've got questions, so let them fly. And I just thought it ended up being the funniest thing because it, I think the funniest thing was how they approached the questions. Nece it wasn't necessarily the questions themselves, but it would always just be like, you know, it, it's one in the morning and we're at whatever bar and they'd come up to you like, Hey man, like, just like, I have a question, like, you know, cause you're, and then they cut cause you're, and I'm like, just say it, man. Like, it's fine. Like, and it just kind of, I don't know, it, like it honestly, uh, talking to a lot of the guys looking back on it, 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 it made us a lot closer because they just, they got to answer questions that they didn't want to ask to anyone else. <laughs> so it, yeah, I don't really have a particular question in, in mind, but it was always just how they asked it. Like, Hey man, like I have a question, you know, you might be able to answer it. Cause you know, you're, and they'd give you that one, but they would never say it. So. I always made him say it before I'd answer the question. <laughs> Steven, anything unusual from your teammates after it sort of became known? Well, 
I mean, once that came out, because I also uh, I also help out with the baseball team as a team manager. So I mean, uh, we we have we have fifty student athletes on the baseball team, and then we have twenty guys on the hockey team. So uh, the amount of questions I got were ridiculous. And like Brock said, it's always at the bar. Like I I went out to the bar uh, last Friday night, and I had to answer. For, well, I don't have to, but they're like, hey man. I got questions and I'm like, about what? Like life? Like where are we going with this? And then, you know, they, they just, they're like, they don't know how to approach it, which I find hilarious. Like Brock does. Cause it, it's always that one 2 AM it's getting late. They're on their like 12th twisted tea. And <laughs> uh, I, I would say it's just funny because like they, these are it, the questions are just ridiculous. And I'm sure, Brock, you could attest to some of the questions that they were asking. Like ridiculous. Could you give us a flavor of them at least? Uh, I mean, like, uh, like you know, you know, are you top, bottom, like all this other stuff, you know, like, um, and then they're like, well, does it feel better when a, when, when, a, when a guy does it to you than a chick? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> like, you know, just some of the, like, I mean, there's way more <laughs> – questions I could go into but those two are typically like the 1 a.m. 2 a.m. questions or hey do you would you do me and I'm like no I don't see you in that way or especially like you know when, when you're in the shower they're just they just go why are you peeking or like you know do you want this tonight like it, it's just like they they start hitting on you and then you start questioning their sexuality so these, these are more mechanical questions, not discussing the sociological impact of homosexuality on Western culture since Christianity. Not one bit. Not uh, one bit. <laughs> I always got, one of the famous questions I'd always get is, like, they always talk about, like, Tinder and Bumble and that, and then, and then they always knew what Grindr was, and it always came up. Like, every weekend, a new person would ask about Grindr, and it's like, man, I don't know. I don't use it. Like, I know what it is. I don't know what to tell yeah. you. Yeah, I actually was gifted. I was gifted a pair of of Christmas socks that were grinder socks from from a, a kid that I refereed with, and I think that was his way of being like, "Hey, who you are? I got you." Well, that's we got awesome. about ten minutes to go. We can talk about questions. You guys uh, can chat uh, offline. Um, Basically, this is this is a, a, a seminar also about acceptance. I'd like you all to uh, sort of say something about what you think the actual acceptance in hockey is, and despite all the language on gay men, do you think ultimately accepted? And we'll start with Adam. Um, so from my experience, at least my team was great, um, but I think that it's not it, it's a case by case scenario. I really think so that's that's my thing and. It depends on the community you grew up in. Depends if you grew up in Minnesota or if you grew up on the East Coast or West Coast. You know, so it looks like we lost Cordy. <laughs> but do you think do you think uh, it is getting better for players or not? I mean, you you for I think the I think it's obviously. I think it's getting better in some instances, but th that's just in some instances. So, Brock. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with Adam. I think it comes down to, we talk about the culture a lot. You talk about hockey, hockey culture in general, but I think every one of these guys can attest. I had some of my, well, a lot of my closest friends come from hockey, people that now know that have been my biggest allies. So I think it comes to case by case, and I think it's, it's definitely come a long ways. And I think, you know, just kind of what sours it for everyone is that one rotten egg that, you know, might be an influencer on a team that just can kind of sway everyone's opinion because they don't want to, you know, they don't want to be on the wrong side of buddy and just things like that. So, it, I mean, it's like that in everything. You, you got it. You got it on all sides. So you, that's like Gordy talks about. You got to tackle it on all sides. It's, it's not just coming from one direction. Steven? Yeah, I gotta agree with Adam and Brock and Gordy that I mean, I mean, especially me being in three different positions here, like as a referee, a coach, and a player. I mean, it's definitely, you know, uh, it was hard to like, you know, my first time back coaching, you know, 
that was hard because, you know, parents are questioning, you know, whether or not you should be in the locker room with, you know, U18s or, you know, do you look at the kids in that sick way? And I'm like, no, they're, they're, I'm here to grow the game, you know? And so that was like one of the tough things I had was, you know, parents questioning my coaching ability because I'm gay. Um, on top of it, um, I think, I, I mean, Gordy could attest to this with the referees. I mean, I've heard nothing but fantastic things from guys I've worked with. And, I mean, you guys yep. uh, saw Brian Hicks' story. I, I've He's texting me. We've, uh, we got dinner one night, like, and I, I think the referee and culture is different than coaching culture and um, playing culture where – I think the referees on the hockey side, they're the best to come out to because I haven't had one negative thing said from any referee, whether it's a referee in chief and a signer to guys up at USA hockey. I mean, it's just been a fantastic run with the referees. And then you have me as a player where, you know, I was just fed up with everything that was being said and I took action and then you know, I reached out to Gordy and I reached out to you and then you guys put my story out there. So Gordy, because you, you came out with the help of a fellow referee who happened to be gay, correct? I did. I did. Um, and I guess that's what it took for me. Um, the, the visibility to, to see the, the fellow referees ask him, um, his boyfriend at the time, um, how he was and how just normal it was in passing conversation to say, Hey, how's your boyfriend? How's life? There was nothing staged about it. There was nothing uncomfortable about it. It was just, that's how it was. And when I, when I saw that, I was like, this, I can do this. I can do this in this, in this community. So I, I texted him, I let him know and kind of walked me through what he did and that's kind of how it went and slowly family friends and then others um it made it easy once i got the support of my family and close friends so last question a one word answer uh from a reader named ford who's gonna win the cup brock i don't know i gotta go west coast so i'm, I'm going western conference i think stars got it sorry guys steven I gotta agree with Brock here. Stars. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're you're yeah. gonna hate it, Gordy, but I'm gonna go with Brock as well. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I do. Really? I hate it, but I have to agree. I hate it so much. I, 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 I have to. I have to agree. There we go. Um, Everyone agrees. Everyone agrees with Dallas. Um, We'll leave, a, we'll leave a great comment from uh, Christopher. Thanks for your visibility, courage, and authenticity. Each of you are breaking barriers and making a huge contribution to shifting the culture of hockey. You're all important role models and trailblazers for a generation of LGBTQ youth. So he says it better than I could. So why don't we just- Thank you. That was, that was uh, awesome. Thank yeah. you all for being on yeah, it. Thank you. Thank this you guys. It'll be available on Facebook. It'll also be available on YouTube starting tomorrow. I think Facebook pretty soon. So. Please send the link to anybody you know who wants to watch it. People who tuned in late, they can watch the whole thing um, on Facebook or on YouTube. Uh, the links will be on Outsports. And uh, I want to thank these four for telling their stories publicly. They were all amazing to work with. And um, the, it, the visibility makes such a difference. And they all, they're all friends each other because of, uh, you know, the, the common love for hockey. So um, let's hope that you know, Yannick or someone else one day is playing in the NHL as an openly gay player, but if not, the more people that come out in these other areas, the better. So I want to thank you guys. Yeah. And it's a great birthday present to be able to host you all. So thank you so much. Yeah, happy birthday. Happy birthday, Jim. Happy yeah. birthday. Yeah, happy birthday, Jim. And thanks to Jim and Sid for organizing this. And I, I want to acknowledge all the questions that we didn't get to. You guys feel free to reach out to me. I won't speak for the other guys, um, you know, social media, no. like that. There's a lot of great questions that we never got to. So thanks for engaging and, and being yeah. allies and everything like that. Yeah. Cheers, Brock. Thanks for saying that. Yeah. And yeah, their, their contact info is on all, me, is on all their stories. You have their contact info, Instagram or, or Facebook or Twitter or email. So they're all very accessible. 